Good afternoon, and for those of you who have been with us for a few minutes, good afternoon again. I'm Kurt Witcher, manager of the Genealogy Center here at the Allen County Public Library, and it's awesome uh, to have you with us on this Wednesday afternoon. These Wednesdays with Witcher are just a little fun activity in the middle of every week during Family History Month uh, to just gather together and to hear some things that uh, I think we should pay a little more attention to in the genealogy space, things that we may want to enjoy a little more about our genealogical research. And at the end of the day, I, I hope my aspiration is that there'll be things that are meaningful to us in finding all of our family stories and really benefiting from, from that wealth of knowledge. So I titled this presentation, this little get together of ours, Finding the Things We Are Not Looking For. And you might think to yourself, what in the world are you talking about, Kurt? Well, I think oftentimes in our research, we're looking for really specific things. We're certainly looking for data around the hatched, matched, and dispatched, right? We're looking for birth, marriage, and death records, dates, and places. And then we're pretty quickly want to move on to maybe census records, maybe a few court records, but, oh, you know, those court records that can be really complicated. Uh, so maybe we don't need that information. Maybe we'll have enough from the hatched, matched, and dispatched, and a few census records to get us back to the next generation. And that's cool, right? I mean, that's really all we need is to get back to the next generation generation. I say that with a big smile on my face because I think most of us really want more, right? We want to find our family stories. And, and to do that, we have to do kind of the impossible task of finding everything. And we know we're never going to find everything, every last piece of information that might tell us more about our family's stories. But we can make, I think, a better run at it than we typically do and I think that we will find things we're not looking for that will enhance our knowledge about our families, will enhance our appreciation of what our ancestors did and how what they did impacts our lives today. So if we do a really good job of looking for our family stories, we will find things that we really didn't know we were looking for. We didn't even know that they existed. So that's what I mean by the title. We're going to look quickly at four different things. Um, nope, there's no handouts for Wednesdays with Witcher, but this slide should tell you everything you need to know, right? GPS, fans, preponderance of evidence. Oh my, has that phrase fallen out of favor in recent decades? And researching in 4D, which is fairly new a fairly new concept, but it encapsulates, excuse me, a lot of things that we talk about in GPS and fans. So we're going to kind of take a quick stroll through these methods, if you will, these strategies for finding our family stories and see if there's any lessons in those, see if there's any learnings, as they used to say, see if there's any wisdom in just taking a kind of different look at some of these strategies for finding our stories. So let's take a look at this. What are we doing and how's that working for us? So if we're doing the same thing we've always done and we're not getting the results we want, we should probably change what we're doing, right? What are we doing? How's that working? More often than we think, we don't really know what we're looking for. <laughs> As I say, parenthetically, sorry, not sorry. I don't mean to make anyone feel bad, but um, we think we're looking for birth and marriage and death dates, but really we're looking for data that will provide us with more story, right? Or, and we're looking for things that will make it easier, possible for us to find the next generation. Too often, I believe our focus is on finding the next generation, and we do a pretty mediocre job of identifying the current generation of interest. So more often than we think, we really don't know what we're looking for, except I just want more. So how can we use these four strategies that we just looked at to get us more, right? So GPS, we have heard about this for a number of years now, stands for genealogical proof standard. Let's take a look at the five elements of the GPS. Reasonably exhaustive research has been conducted. That's nah, pretty standard. All these are standard. Some of us, certainly not me, but some of us could recite these in our sleep. Each statement of fact has a complete and accurate source citation. Evidence is reliable and has been skillfully correlated and interpreted, not casually, it's skillfully. And any 
contradictory evidence has been resolved and here's the winner. And the conclusion has been soundly reasoned and coherently written. Let's take a quick dive into each of these five. So reasonably exhaustive research has been conducted. Do we really appreciate what that means? That means that you have at least taken a casual look at all of these bullet points here and more. In 2022, in the third decade of the 21st century, to use bad English, we can't not look at these sources if we're going to say in any way that we've done reasonably exhaustive research. Internet Archive, Hadi Trust, millions of entities. Family Search, millions of entries. Wikipedia, yeah, I know. For a lot of people, Wikipedia is like a dirty word. Like, oh my gosh, Kurt, how can you say that? That's such a terrible place. Anybody can put up anything. Um, well, not exactly. We'll take a few moments to look at that in a moment. WorldCat, Archive Grid, Nut, Archive Grid, Nutmuck, Libraries and Organization Catalogs, and these are just getting started in finding everything, right? Reasonably exhaustive search. So let's take a look at just some quick examples. I mentioned Internet Archive. We've highlighted the books section, that little gold books up in the top of your uh, slide. There's 30 million books on here, as well as websites, as well as pamphlets and government documents, et cetera. We have to use this site if we're doing reasonably exhaustive research, and we can find a lot. We almost don't know what to look for except a surname of interest, an ethnic, excuse me, ethnicity, ethnic group of interest, or a geographic area of interest. Geographic area and ethnic group are really consequential in our searches of these large bibliographic databases. Oh my goodness, can we find a lot here? Family search. And I know you're probably shaking your head now saying, come on, Kurt, we all know about family search. We've been using family search forever. This is not a big thing, a uh, big thing, a big deal. Well, I'm going to propose that it is a big thing because how many of us, when we go to family search, we kind of say, eh, gosh, can't get to those records because they're locked. Oh, well, I've gotten everything I can get. Do we make the effort to go to an affiliate library like the genealogy center here? where we can get access to more of the locked records that are locked on the open web? Do we make other efforts to find copies of those records that are locked? Uh, sometimes we uh, are too quick to use, oh gosh darn, I can't get to this as a reason not to do exhaustive searching reasonably exhaustive searching, so, so pay attention. Here's this ugly, 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 terrible site, Wikipedia. Um, I love Wikipedia because I believe for us, it's very fossil, very easy for us to quickly determine what's a good entry and what's not a good entry. For me, a good entry has sources, has notes, end notes at the end of it, so we can check the veracity of the article that's posted in front of us, and as importantly for me, and I hope for you, provides us with new sources, new places that we might check. It's like a springboard to more information. So Owsley County, one of the major counties for my in-laws, knowing the history of how it was formed, knowing some of the shenanigans going around in that county, knowing the counties it was formed from and what counties were broken off from it, really consequential. And yes, they do have references at the end of this article. Some are really, really contemporary and really not very germane to family history research, but some may be quite germane and be wonderful springboards for us to find additional information, find things we weren't looking for, but tell us more about our families, help us find more of our stories. WorldCat was another entity I mentioned on that slide just a few ago. WorldCat is the largest bibliographic database. It's a catalog, a combined catalog of about 10,000 libraries worldwide with about 2 billion records in it. So you're looking for Rowan County, North Carolina. You look along the facets along the left-hand side, you see the box that one can check for books and then print books. There's over a thousand print books listed in WorldCat on Rowan County, North Carolina. You can click on a title and you can find the nearest library by your GPS coordinates or by your zip code. 
And well, lo and behold, this title is held here at the Allen County Public Library. But you can find where titles are nearest to you. Um, it's one of the many features of, of WorldCat. Try it out sometimes. It's great insomnia buster. Can't sleep in the middle of the night? Play with WorldCat. Archive Grid is another product by the same company. It just narrows in on what archives might be available in places that you wouldn't know. Do you know that a lot of the Allen County Public Library's genealogy center collections are listed in Archive Grid because they are technically manuscripts, part of an archive. Nutmuck is the national level of Archive Grid in a way. These two really work together. Nutmuck stands for National Union Catalog of Manuscript Collections. Is it fun to use? Not really. Is it easy to use? Yeah, you'd probably say no, but it is a way, another insomnia buster, to find where there might be manuscripts to find things you weren't looking for relative to your ancestors' ethnic group, to your ancestors' occupation, uh, to the geographic area where you believed your ancestors lived, farmed, built canals, uh, built railroads. Uh, it's pretty amazing when we kind of get out of our comfort zone a little bit and look for things that inform our research, inform where, where we want to look. Library of Congress, Oh my gosh, what an amazing website. Amazing because there's so much information there and amazing because it even confounds librarians. It's, it's the uh, just classic example of a whole lot of, pardon the technical term, stuff arranged in not necessarily logical or intuitive ways. So when you have your search box up here at the top, if you click on the little carrot, the down arrow, you can see all the different choices collections in which you can search, but there's also things, buttons along the bottom. Library catalog and digital collections are two of the most important, I believe, for what we're looking for. You can spend hours trying to look at the collections of the Library of Congress. I also would call your attention to newspapers because Chronicling America is an amazing site of tens of millions of newspaper pages from several generations back that again, might inform us about our ancestors' lives, might inform us about our family stories, might give us information we didn't even know we were looking for. And there's library catalogs all over the country. Davenport, Iowa has a special collections called the Sloan Richardson Special Collections. Looking through that, pretty amazing. The West Nebraska Family Research and History Center has a number of digital assets that you see on your screen now that you can recognize for free. Developing a strategy where we try to find every single library archive record repository in our families' areas of interest, where they lived, what they did, where they engaged in commerce, where they sold their goods, all those important history contexts, all these are searchable, discoverable in many library catalogs. Pretty amazing. So the second statement in the five of GPS, each statement of fact has a complete and accurate source citation. Let's flip that on its ear. Let's say for each and every source we look at, we look for source citations. We look for footnotes, endnotes, and bibliographies so that we can springboard into other data sets, other pools of information, things we didn't even know again that we were looking for. So yes, it's very consequential and very important to source, to note, to provide footnotes and endnotes to our research. But in everything we look at, do the opposite. Look for the footnotes and endnotes and see if they can lead you to new information. See if they can springboard you into things that Eh, you might not have thought of otherwise. Two more GPS statements. The evidence is reliable and has been skillfully correlated and interpreted, and any contradictory evidence has been resolved. Well, my response to that is, how can we know? How can we do, how can we do this if we haven't made the effort to find it all? Having evidence that's reliable and skillfully correlated and interpreted and having rebuffed, answered, addressed any contradictory evidence, we don't really know whether we've done a good job at that if we haven't done a good job trying to find all the information. 
I think it's really important. And the final point, the conclusion has been soundly reasoned and coherently written. Oh, we're supposed to write? Again, I say this with a smile on my face because so many of us are information hunters and gatherers and we do nothing as far as writing our research. That is critical. Are we researchers and storytellers or are we stuff gatherers? I'm gonna take a small little side tangent here. Many of us have lamented the fact that our children and grandchildren aren't interested in our family history. And as I have done a few times in the past, I'm gonna ask an uncomfortable question. And that uncomfortable question is, whose fault is that? I think we have to own that because we collect a lot of stuff, makes sense to us, but we haven't written our research. We haven't woven the story. We haven't articulated the story in any way. So to our descendants, it's just stuff. And a lot of it doesn't make sense to them because we haven't connected the dots, haven't made the connection. So we can use GPS to motivate and inspire ourselves to write our research. It's not good enough. I don't think it ever was, but today in the 21st century, it's not good enough just to gather stuff. You need to write the research. And the GPS tells us that's what we need to be doing, correct? So we've heard about fans switching into the next really important way of finding what we're not looking for. We've talked about, we've heard about fans forever and we kind of shake our heads and we smile and we say, yep, yep, Kurt, got that, got that. I do that all the time. Uh, fans stands for friends, associates, and neighbors. But do we really do that? And we really need to make an effort to do it in an exponentially huge way. What do I mean by that? Well, friends not just close friends, but friends and associates need, needs to mean acquaintances, needs to mean congregational members, people that are in social clubs, organizations, and, and all the other things where we might find our ancestors participating. That's what fans really means. It's not, yep, check, found a fan, found a couple of associates, business associates, found the neighbors. We're all good, Kurt. I would argue, no, we're not as good as we think we are because we really haven't done the deep dive in finding all of the fans or as many of them as possible. So we're gonna see this picture again in a few minutes. Every single person in this picture is related to, not biologically, not genealogically, but occupationally related to each other because they belong to a particular company in the 326th. Uh, division in World War II, where my father-in-law served. So if I really want to take a deep dive on my father-in-law, who was an amazing individual, there exists in the realm of possibility that I might need to look for the letters and diaries to see if they even exist for every one of these soldiers. Because maybe out of all of these individuals, there are seven that actually had written letters to and from the home front that had been saved. And maybe there, there's three diaries. But if I'm really trying to find all the fans, all the neighbors, all the associates, I'm going to be looking for that. I know it might sound ridiculous or slightly ridiculous on the face, but because how in the world, Kurt, could I do that? Well, increasingly, we can use technology to leverage these amazing opportunities and make realities out of many of these possibilities. So our, our challenge, turn possibilities into realities. So yes, if I'm looking for Charles Eugene Young and knowing as much about his life as possible, I really should explore to see if any of these associates, any of his uh, comrades actually had letters and diaries. He did not um, that we've been able to discover. We know about looking up and down the census record. So here's my father highlighted uh, on the 1950 census. And uh, yeah, we, we kind of nod. Yeah, Kurt, I know all about that, looking before and looking after. But if we're really doing neighbors, we're looking pages before on a census record, pages after. If we're looking for neighbors, we're looking streets away, not just on your street. So it's all a matter of intensity and maybe definition about who neighbors are. We need to cast the net widely. 
So Kentucky is known for, and I think many states are actually, but Kentucky in particular, because I've been researching my father-in-law's family, have some really wonderful geographic uh, names. Uh, my father-in-law was bi- uh, born in Wild Dog Creek, Kentucky. A number of you have heard me say that before. Come on, be honest on a Wednesday afternoon. Wouldn't you love to be able to claim that you were born in Wild Dog Creek, Kentucky? That is so awesome. Well, another part of the family was in Sweet Gum Branch. It's like, well, where is Sweet Gum Branch? Well, here's that building context thing again. How can we find all the neighbors if we don't know where all the entities are? And I would purport to you this afternoon that sometimes neighbors aren't people, but they're places and entities. So when I pulled up this on a topo style map, um, you can see the various churches and schools and towns around Sweet Gum Branch. And if I zoomed in closer, only when I zoomed this topo map in closer did Round Top Church show up, which is right beneath or south of Sweet Gum Branch. So to me, that was very symbolic of, yes, we need to go deeper. We need to go closer. Um, we need to cast a wide net and then look carefully in everything in that, in that wide net. So challenging us to think anew about fans. The preponderance of evidence that existed decades before the GPS, the genealogical proof standard, and it it was never widely embraced because people didn't take the time to really figure out what it meant for them. And the professionals didn't seem to like it because it didn't have very directive, very specific things that you could point to and say, do this. Well, what is the preponderance of evidence? Well, it's clear and convincing evidence, proof beyond a reasonable doubt. I know I've already rolled back to this a couple of times, but proof beyond a reasonable doubt means that we've gathered a lot of evidence, right? I've been criticized and I'll own that criticism by a number of people saying, I shouldn't talk about our family's legacies as crime scenes, but I kind of like the CSI approach, right? To genealogy, because we're going to the scene of where we believe our ancestors lived and we're gathering as much evidence as we can to support or refute our hypothesis that our ancestors actually lived there. If we just took a a couple pieces of information, we just look for a few things that match what we think, then we merrily go off saying, yep, this is what it is. But there may be like a thousand pieces of evidence that say your two pieces of evidence are wrong. They're fabricated, they're out of context. They were uh, miscreated by someone. So proof beyond a reasonable doubt means that we're gathering a lot of evidence. I fear a lot of us gather evidence along the lines of the picture on the left. We have a very, very small circle, but using this analogy that I've been criticized for, but when you see crime scene investigators, I mean, they tape off a large area and they're taking pictures and gathering evidence of all kinds of things. They're not just where the body was found. They're not just where the shell casings were found. They're looking all over the place within reason, for things out of place, for things that don't belong, for extra things. Uh, That's how we need to be in our research. And that's what the preponderance of evidence means. Researching in 4D, this was a a theme through the Midwestern Roots Conference that was earlier this year in Indianapolis. I really like this because it's taking our whole concept of building context around our ancestors to the next level. So what is researching in in 4D? It's kind of an extension of GPS, genealogical proof standard. It fits well with our fans strategy. It's really um, what a colleague uh, calls sensory based approach. So we're trying to build the biggest context around our ancestor as possible. So we're not just doing fans, but we're kind of doing fans of fans. And I'll show you a couple of quick examples as we roll to the um, top of this hour. We know this, and if we don't know it, please uh, do some research, Google it. Science fiction really is sort of the predictor of what science is gonna do. Most of the space discoveries, most, not all, but most of the medical discoveries, they've been telegraphed ahead of time in science fiction. I would purport to you, and, and before you shake your head, no, before your head explodes, just say, but take a pause, take a breath and, and just try it out. I would propose to you that historical fiction 
also can give us a lot of clues on where we, in real life, finding real records about our real ancestors, can actually gain some information and some knowledge. So try that on. Science fiction leads to a lot of science. Historical fiction can instruct, inform, and guide our historical research. We've claimed in the Genealogy Center that doing the history eliminates the mystery. If we just thoroughly, completely, deeply, and richly research the history of an area, we're going to find a lot of what we didn't know we were looking for, and it's going to put a finer point on us finding our family stories. So if I want to find this Charles Eugene Young, my father, and I want to find as much about him as possible, yeah, here's that picture again. I'm going to need to really see about how I can explore for information about all of these folks. What do we know about letters to and from the home front? They often talk about comrades. And so we might glean information about our family members in others' letters and diaries. We find this letter in the family papers for Charles where um, his mother is being contacted saying he was, he was injured, he's wounded, and he's okay. It's like, oh, what's that about? Charlie would never talk about his World War II experiences. He's like many, 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 many World War II veterans. And we oftentimes wonder why. Why won't they share? Why won't they talk about their experience? We want to honor them. We want to know that thread of our family history fabric. We want to weave that into our stories. Well, look at Ken Burns' The War, and you will know at an up close and personal level, what our ancestors who fought in World War II went through. And it will become a lot clearer to you why they didn't want to talk about something so horrible and so miserable that teenagers and young 20s men who were our ancestors, um, what they had to endure uh, during that war. Other ways you can do more 4D, more building context. What about World War II audio files at the Library of Congress, as well as the Library of Congress's Veterans History Project? There are memory projects all across the country that talk about and recount the stories and the lives of veterans. Uh, even World War II historical fiction can identify locations and record types uh, and strategies for finding more information. It's pretty amazing. And there's some amazing historical fiction written around World War II that if I want to find even more about what my father-in-law must have been feeling, what he must have been thinking, what his anxieties and fears were that kept him silent for most of his entire adult life on this really traumatic experience that he and so many other experienced, the ones who lived through it. And going through his family papers, um, after his passing, found a number of things that, again, just build a wonderful context. Is there anything genealogical in this? These are his prayer cards, his handwritten prayer cards. I didn't know this was a thing, but apparently at the Calvary Presbyterian Choir, when he, and he loved the choir. I knew that his entire life, loved the choir. They would designate certain people to say a prayer before each choir practice. And Charlie had probably two inches thick of these three by five cards, and he'd write the prayer on one side, and then he'd write the date on the other side of when he said this prayer. And this card and three others out of that two inch stack had the honor, I call it an honor, of being said four times. Most cards once or twice. This card in 66, twice in 67, and once in 68. Is there anything really genealogical here? Uh, no, but it tells me another piece of Charlie's story. And the more pieces we can have, the better, the fuller, the richer that story. And that's really what it's, what it's all about. And speaking of things that um, we find that we're not looking for. So anytime I have an opportunity, a new database, a new newspaper database, I always search for my father because he said very little about his upbringing. Um, I have a number of hypotheses about why he said very little, but he did say very little. And he told us, I know this sounds like heresy, don't mean to uh, upset anyone, but he told us things that were just not true. So whenever I do newspaper research, I always look for Jasper, Indiana. I always look for Valentine Witcher, my paternal grandfather, whom I never met because he died before I was born. And I look for Charlie Witcher and Doris Angler. And um, my father, when we were growing up as kids, I'm one of five, uh, two of five, as they would say in Star Trek, 
um, we never got to participate in extracurricular activities. And my father would always say, well, that's because when I went to school, I never participated in extracurricular activities and it was good enough for me. Well, lo and behold, when I was searching some newspaper databases here in the Jasper Herald, June of 1949, Jasper boys to attend Hoosier Boys State. So these boys are attending Hoosier Boys Hoosier State. Uh, it's a one week program as you can read there. And oh my goodness, there's Charles Witcher. And further on in the article, he was chosen, selections were made in consideration of scholarship, citizenship, and oh my goodness, extracurricular school activities. Oh, but I never did any extracurricular activities when I was growing up. And here we are, a newspaper article on the senior class play is set for tonight. You get a nice little recap of the play and members of the cast are, oh my goodness, there's Charlie Witcher again, the person who didn't participate in any extracurricular activities. My father also told us he only had one year of college and that was in a seminary. And he really thinks he should have been a priest, but he was lured away by the uh, draws of um, married life. And he only went to St. Minard's Seminary in Southern Indiana for one year. Well, Charlie, au contraire, here's a newspaper article. He's on the Dean's List, Collegeville, Indiana, Charles Witcher, 417 East 14th Street, Jasper, freshman at St. Joseph College in Rensselaer. Not St. Minard's, St. Joseph College in Rensselaer. All that's just a way of saying we often can find things we're not looking for. That makes our family stories richer. That makes us understand at a fuller and deeper level about our ancestors, about what things were important in their lives. And I have to believe that informs us about them and about those who came before us. And it informs us about their lives and our lives are inextricably attached to our ancestors' lives. So I hope that uh, this Wednesday with Witcher has given you some ideas, has perhaps provided you with a couple of, hmm, I need to check on that moments, and has motivated you again to try to find all the information, all the answers. When we say find all the records, we don't mean the ones that are conveniently available on Ancestry are the ones that Family Search has wide open on their webpage. We really mean all, and we have more and more tools at our disposal to find all the records. Thanks for joining me. We're about halfway through Family History Month. I sure hope you've taken advantage of some of our many programs, and I hope you'll take advantage of forthcoming programs as well. We have things going on all month. Go to genealogycenter.org and take a look. So glad, so thankful that you were with us this afternoon. Stay in touch. And if you have a question for my talented team here at the Genealogy Center, please send it to genealogy at acpl.info and they'll be happy, happy to assist you. Until next week or until tomorrow on our wonderful Thursday evening program, take care, stay well, and enjoy finding your family stories.